Subbase of Dale Mabry in Tallahassee, and it was one of a string of bases throughout Florida at the time that the Army Air Corps had. <clears throat> Approximately 120 to 140 pilots trained here each month prior to being sent overseas as replacement pilots to replace those lost in combat or being rotated out. <clears throat> Dad was in the 312 squadron. The other squadron was the 441st, which his squadron liked to call the 440 worst. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, there was a bit of rivalry there about that. Um, as I understand it, there were three main reasons why the Army was putting all these air bases in Florida. The first was they needed to train pilots and the weather here was good, so it was ideal training ground. The second was the U-boat threat. They were sinking U-boats off the coast and by having these air bases around constant patrol, it helped die that down a little bit. And the third was that the fear was that Britain would fall. And if Britain fell, they felt like Germany would invade through Florida. Florida at that time was very sparsely populated and mostly undeveloped. There were only 1.9 million people listed in the 1940 census. So these next three slides are stock photos of the airplanes that were uh, based here and the pilots used to train here. This one is the Curtis P-40 um, Warhawk. And it was a single engine fighter bomber fighter plane and it was first brought into service in 1938 and it was the airplane that the Army had when the war started. Um, now these planes were famous for being the planes that the Flying Tigers flew over in China. And they flew those prior to the start, prior to the entry U.S. entry into the war. The second slide is the P-51 Mustang, which has an interesting history. Um, that became the premier fighter of the air, <clears throat> but it was a plane that almost wasn't. The British contracted with North America to design and build that airplane, and it was initially equipped with the Allison engine, and the performance of that plane was very disappointing uh, with the Allison engine. And so the British took that engine out and replaced it with the Rolls Royce Merlin engine, and it became the fighter that uh, was the premier altitude and, and escorted the bombers back and forth. It was a 12 cylinder in line, Rolls Royce. It gave it the range and the performance that they needed. Yeah. <clears throat> it had an astonishing kill ratio of 19 to 1. Yeah. And about 2,500 were lost in combat. The third is the P-47 Thunderbolt. Now, this was one that my dad specialized in servicing. And uh, it, was, it was built by Republic it was noted for its firepower. It had eight 50 caliber machine guns and carried either five inch rockets or 2,500 pounds of bombs. Now it was nicknamed the jug because if you stood it on its nose, it resembled the, the milk jug of the time uh, that they had. Um, 
It was the premier ground attack plane in World War II. Um, it had a very sturdy airframe and could absorb a lot of damage. So it was prized by pilots because the ability to sustain battle damage, which you get a lot of in ground attack, and still return the pilots to base. Thunderbolt pilots claim to have destroyed 86,000 railroad cars, 9,000 locomotives, 6,000 armored vehicles, and 68,000 trucks during the Normandy breakout. 247 Thunderbolts of the 405th Fighter Group destroyed a German column of 122 tanks, 259 other vehicles, and 11 artillery pieces. Wow. Now, <clears throat> these pilots and planes needed a place to practice. And so there was a practice target range that was developed on 12,552 acres uh, that was north northwest of present day, day Florida. And they practiced strafing, bombing, and rocket attacks there. So in order to in order to serve, you know, the pilots had to go here on the base. The pilots had to go through their, their flight training because what they did here was their advanced training prior to sending them overseas. So this is the last training they got. And of course, the enlisted men had to go through their basic training and uh, ground school uh, for repairing the airplane. And so, one back. And so dad was inducted in, in Syracuse, New York, and they went to, I guess, an induction center in, in uh, Newark, New Jersey. And it looks like it was not all work, but it sure looks cold and damp there. <laughs> so he signed up, dad signed up initially to be a pilot in the Flying Sergeant program. His orders were mistakenly sent to Italy to another D'Antonio, which we don't know who that was or what the relationship was, or if there was one. And his orders caught up with him two years later. And by that time, things had changed. And when his section was sent overseas to the Pacific Theater, he was promoted to instructor and crew chief, and he stayed behind to train others in servicing, maintaining, and repairing the aircraft. And besides that, he met Mother at the time, and he decided <laughs> to pass on that opportunity. Oh, <laughs> <coughs> and so from there, they went to uh, basic training and they did their basic training in Miami Beach and <coughs> stayed in, or they barracked in a hotel there, the Arnold Hotel. It sounds tough, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> and so, Life on the Ferry Base. The following photos were ones that were taken from Mom and Dad's uh, collection of photos. And so the first one is the bomb wreck. And you can see the barracks in the background. And that smoke, isn't that some ugly smoke coming out of those chimneys there? On the way here, I took my wife Nancy by and, and showed her a repurposed barracks that had become the Ferry Garden Club. Mm -hmm. I can take you in if you need to. <laughs> <laughs> Without the key, if you want to look inside. <laughs> uh, sir, yes, sir. The Perry Garden Club was right down here. Right. It came from Foley. It used to be the Foley Garden Club. Oh. That's where it came from. Oh, really? I thought it was one of the barracks here. No, sir. No? No, excuse me. And those barracks were all down here, this way, on that next road over there. Okay. And then, I don't know if you remember where the Elk Club used to be here. That was headquarters. Okay. And right down here where the stage is, where they get up there and sing, you know, mm -hmm. how it's built, that was the theater. Hmm. Interesting. I'd always been told that that was one of the barracks here, so thank you yeah. for that was the a, a few of those barracks rolled out and moved around, you know. I know people places. did use them for housing and re repurposed them. I'm sorry? I said I know people did 
repurpose those barriers. Uh, yeah. yeah. And a lot of people lived out here before they were ever moving. You know, so. Believe just to the <clears throat> planes on the ramp there, you can see all the P40s. I believe there are P40s in the background there on that one uh, photo on the left, and then more P40s, and then that's dad next to the one on the right. And that was taken here, you know, before we had stock photos, but that was uh, that was a Mustang that was flying by the base here. And here you can see the old hangar in the background that's still out there. And the uh, <clears throat> P-47's lined up in front of the hangar. And of course the air crew on the wing out there on the right. But. You know, we had a lot of guys that came in here and met local girls here that married them like your dad did. So they got where they call this place Harry Dodge. <laughs> that was the name of it. <laughs> Harry Dice. That's where that came from. How about it? the right to continue. And a lot of, you know, this is a military base, so a lot of aircraft transitioned through here. That was an F3F, a German F3F Wildcat that they had a photo of that must have been coming through. Those, those planes were primarily used by the, the Navy and the Marine Corps in the Pacific on carriers in those Pacific bases. And it was an early, it was an early fighter that they had replaced by the uh, Hellcat, I believe. Okay. And these are just pictures. I don't know who those two guys are on the, on the left there and what that plane is. Um, but it was one that, that they had. And that was Dad in the cockpit. And then on the wing, that's another. Hello, that's, that's one way to do it. Can you hear his phone? You may have spoken. I don't know where this can go. He didn't see all the cars. Does anybody have any idea how many local women matched up? With airmen, there's a lot of them. I did. <laughs> there was a record or a, you know, a, a story. As many as they could. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I knew three pilots. Okay. This is one of Dad's. Uh, I knew uh, a couple of fellow specialists. Uh, what was his last name? Trevino. Huh? Sitting on the uh, <laughs> horizontal stabilizer side of one of the planes. And then there was like, pardon? There was a strong plane to be able to chop up and just lean back on them. That's why they call them stabilizers. <laughs> that one on the left looks like a trainer to me. That's dead in the cockpit. I don't know who the other person is. Um, but you see it looks like a biplane and it looks like it's a tube and fabric plane. And I wonder if it was one of the steermen in some kind of trainer plane which I didn't know they had here. But, uh, and then that's dad helping the pilot in the cockpit. person had to take it to the manufacturer and that person sent it to the government. 
to uh, ration fuel. I wanted to save it, but I had one of them ration books. And it got stolen. Oh, no. <laughs> she walked. And then the same thing with gasoline. And that's my dad's uh, his 36 Chevy. He, he was getting fuel for that. And the A, they had different uh, values on these. I guess you call it values and levels on them. And so the A was for uh, non-essential use. So what that entitled it to was about five gallons a week. And of course they had to do the same thing, sign it, turn it in, and it went to the manufacturer and it went to the, the government to keep track of the fuel. So this next one is an application for a ration book. Everybody had to have a ration book to buy almost everything that they used. So this was my grandmother. And at that time they had a, well actually they got it back during the Depression, they had a farm over in Madison that they survived off of. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. 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 But they, she also, they also lived in, a, uh, in one of the mill houses there in Foley. Uh, but apparently she had it sent there. What's interesting on this is that if you mail this in Jacksonville, it cost you two cents. If you mailed it uh, outside of Jacksonville, it was three cents. Hmm. So everybody had the ration books and there was a red and a blue ration. And it depended on whether you got meat and those items were in their dairy products. We used to drive down in a place called Chester Store. Yeah, it's right there on the corner. Yeah, everything in there. But I just bought drinks and candy bars. They were all a, a nickel. A drink like you got there costs a nickel. It's two dollars and thirty-five cent now. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and we we pump gas outside, but you had to pump it up into a, a tank. And then it fell out. Oh. Yeah. Never heard of that. And, and so the, the live, this is a pass to live off base. It's my dad's pass. There's no date on it. But to live off base, you had to have permission. And uh, we're assuming this was after he was married, um, but we don't know for sure. But uh, I figured that's when he lived off base after being married. Okay, the next slide is, uh, is a first letter. And what this is, is a letter from my dad to my mom. And um, they had met prior to this. And if you look at the date, it was in January. So I wondered if it was a, a Christmas or a New Year's dance that they met at. And I'd always thought it was a USO dance, but I said that one time in front of her and she very sternly told me, no, it was a dance in Foley. Oh, okay. So apparently they had a place where they have dances there in, in Foley. And uh, so he's writing this from the hospital where he had fallen off the wing of the plane and broken his leg and they had sent him to the hospital. I guess they had a hospital here. And, uh, and from there, he went to Dale Navy in Tallahassee. And that's where he wrote this letter. We didn't have the hospital. She thought he had stood her up. And she was really angry. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. 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 Because he no show for the day. And uh, so he was asking her forgiveness and also for photographs. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so she must have uh, she must have forgiven him oh. <laughs> because they were married on April 1st, 1944. And uh, dad used to tease her that he thought it was an April Fool's joke. <laughs> <laughs> of course, she didn't think it was very funny. <laughs> And these are just some photos of uh, 
Right there, Matthew Miller, man. This is 36 Chevy we talked about. And uh, so that's him in the, in the uh, it must be some kind of Kurgan play. Uh, he was, uh, when the war in Europe ended, he was assigned to Fairfield Sushin Army Air Base in California near San Francisco. At that point, the U.S. was mobilizing for the invasion of, of, Jan of Japan, which they expected to be due to a lot of casualties. Uh, he went out first without bombs and came uh, to secure off-base housing. And then he and a buddy came back, picked up the wives, and all four of them headed to Foley, headed from Foley to San Francisco in that 36 Chevy. Mm -hmm. uh, after the surrender of Japan, he was discharged from Camp Beale, California. And at the, that point, they picked up and headed east in that same 36 Chevy. After he was discharged, my parents lived near his family in Auburn, New York for a few years, then moved back to Perry when his health started declining. He passed away in 1971 when he was 49. My mom remained in Perry, in the Foley Perry area for the rest of her life. So, I want to thank everybody for having me. Uh, if, uh, if we help to get the history correct, thank y'all. Well, at this point, if anybody has any questions that would like to to ask, if you have a question, I will try to answer. We'll try. There's one. Things are really cool. That's right, they're a single pilot. This is uh, a uniform that I had uh, just started all this. I really didn't plan to do all this. I just was going to give this to Ward and say, here, find something to do with this. But, but anyway, thank you, Ward. And, uh, thank you for coming down and just. So your dad's uniform they wore here at the, at the base, right? It is. Yeah. And uh, I didn't know what this strike was, and so I had to look it up. And uh, three years of service. Three years of service. That's right. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. She needs to shop. When we uh, when we get done with that, we'd love to get a picture with you guys. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so Where did you grow up? Mm -hmm. I grew up here. You grew, so they were here, or you were here? During they moved here and back here in 1955. Okay. How many children did your parents have? Four. Four. I had a, an older sister and two younger sisters. Where were y'all born? Right <laughs> Where were you born? I was born in Auburn, New York. Oh, okay. We moved here when I was two. So we get most of the family then, the kids were raised here? They were. And your dad, he, he was only 49 when he passed? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's kind of a funny story. I remember my, my mother telling me that uh, when the base was opening, no one saw an army officer walking uptown and come and ride back to the base. Everybody wanted to take that army officer because they could get him into the PS. Don't have the rationing. You could him get the TX and do some real shit. Yeah. 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 We got we got three surviving here and all that. Three surviving buildings from the World War II. We got the big hangar. We got the sheep range, and then we got the sewer pump. I meant to miss her by it. She was really good. We got a little bit. They used to. Look at the guys there. Oh, no. the girls, the guys there. Oh, well, they're pretty good. Yeah. yeah. They can jack and tell them. Oh, they can clean up. They can make some synchronizing. They can hit a certain spot at a certain distance. Mm. 
Because if I just hear <clears throat> uh, how was it tied to the, the beach uh, artillery range at uh, being in Little Grass Island and I believe they they had a small barracks down there. The, are you familiar with the Deco Beach history and the barracks? And, no. I'm not. Yeah. Yeah. You know where that was on Kelsey? Mm -hmm. It's where 